scripture reading will be taken from the Gospel of Mark, second chapter, verses 18 through 22, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Scriptures. Again, that's uh, Mark, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, after which everybody will arise and be led in prayer by Brother Blair Erkman. And it reads, The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, What the, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No, no one sews a piece of unstrung cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Thus concludes the reading of the word. Everyone, please arise. Let us go to our Father at this time. Almighty God in heaven, Jehovah God. Father, we're so thankful that we can come to your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, Father. Holy Father, you've, you've blessed us once again, Father. Father, you've blessed us once again to, to see the first day of the week and the first day of the rest of our lives. We're so thankful, Father, that you're blessing us and keeping us under your care, your mercy, your love, your strength. And great God, we know it's not because we're worthy or good to have said or done anything worth praise. Your kind, merciful, loving Father, and we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the way you guide and direct our lives through your word, through your spirit, through your son. Father, you're helping us to live a life of peace. You're helping us to live a life of joy in a world that's, that's topsy-turvy, a world that's turned upside downwards. 
Your prophet Isaiah said it a long time ago, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And we see all of this right before our eyes. This world has gone absolutely mad. But as your children, Father, as your servants, we're praying for peace, we're praying for help, we're praying for understanding. Father, we don't understand the things that happen in this life. We got these tragedies, the, the, the tornadoes and the hurricanes and, and the flooding and, and the killing, the, the attacks on the police, the government is corrupt. It's just so much going on that we don't understand. That's why we rely on you, Father, to help us. Guide us and direct us and keep us, keep us under your care, your mercy, your love, and your strength. We thank you so much, Father. And we pray on behalf of those who are suffering at this time, those in the Texas area, the flooding. We know that many members here have family members there, and we're praying for them. We're praying for the rescue efforts that are put forth by the first responders, those who, who come out when tragedy strikes. They're the first ones there to help. And we're praying for them that they would do their, do their very best to try to help people during these tragic times. Father, many have lost loved ones. We've heard about uh, uh, our sisters here who lost brothers and one lost a sister, Sister Bush and Dorothy Sharp. We're praying for them, that you'll comfort them during their time of loss. And many others, some are recuperating from surgery, some are in surgery, some are scheduled for surgery, some are convalescent. Father, you're there through all our trials and tribulations. You can help us through all of them, and we thank you so much. We're praying for those who are traveling. We're praying for those who are suffering. We just thank you so much. Father, bless our speaker this morning with a ready recollection of the things he studied. As we hear your engrafted word, Father, help us not to become dull of hearing, but be motivated, encouraged, and enlightened from your truths. So bless our brother as he presents your word to us this morning that we'll be attentive, to your word, we'll listen, and we'll apply those truths to our daily walk. It's never for our glory, it's always for yours. Bless those who may be on their way here, and bless those who are visiting with us this morning. We thank you so much, and we offer this prayer through Jesus. Let us all say, amen. amen. As I journey through the land, seeing and as I go, you know I'm pointing souls to Calvary, well to the crimson flow. Well, many arrows pierced my soul from without, within, but my Lord, my Lord. Yeah. 
as I pass I'll be home, home at last and ever to rejoice and sing in that oh I want to see see he him and look upon his face Get on your feet one time before the minister gets up. We're going to sing a couple of verses of Mansion Robe. Stretch your lungs out and your legs and stuff. I know y'all been sitting in front of that TV watching the fight all night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to trade my early home for a better one, bright and fair. Rise left to pay mansion for children in the air. I'm joining me. There's no sorrow can be found where I see my mansion, robe and crown. Well, I want a man, a man, a robe and a crown. Sunshine day and night. No, it ain't a whole cold, no rain will fall. No, for the sun shines ever bright. You know that I need no heaven, no, and I'll, I'll just wrap my robe around me. Well, I want a mansion robe and crown. Oh, Lord, give me a mansion. Try to do. Hey, but one day I'll be rewarded. Well, with, with a crown so bright and new. You know that I wear a smile so bright, for there'll be no cause for a crown when I receive my mansion. Want a mansion robe? Oh, Lord, give me a mansion. right here. Mm -hmm. Lord, I want a brand new mansion, a robe and a crown in glory. There mm -hmm. I know that peace and love will always abound forever. Let me be among the same to your throne. Surround, Lord, please deserve a mansion, a mansion, a robe and a crown. Seated. 
Let the church say amen. Amen, amen. amen again. Amen. These brothers are fired up this morning, aren't they? Lord, I want a mansion. I want a, not only the mansion, I want the robe. And not only the mansion and the robe, I want the crown too. Way over in, in glory land. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's good to be here this morning. And we thankful to God for allowing us to see a brand new day. Amen. I tell you, my Bible and my notes fell off on the floor. The place was shaking so hard. I wasn't looking, Klein saw it. I just heard a thump. I thought it was Joe. <laughs> uh, but God is good. We're thankful for uh, such a spirited way they have led us this morning. And we uh, like to welcome uh, those of our guests who are here this morning. And we trust, hope, and pray this is not, if this is your first time, it won't be your last and that um, our doors swing on welcome hinges. Amen? And uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, we want you to turn, be turning to uh, Mark, the second chapter. And while you're turning, we, as was um, reiterated, was said in the prayer, we want to reiterate um, to be mindful of those who uh, are suffering down uh, south in Texas. And um, I have some relatives there in Houston and uh, my wife was talking to one of our relatives they really were not aware before the storm hit uh, how much danger they were in they said that's down in Corpus and my wife said no I, I think you all are gonna get uh, some of that a lot of rain so be mindful of that because many people stayed not um, aware of the uh, rain to come and the the effects of the storm and corpus have moved up um, uh, through other parts of Texas. So be mindful of, uh, and I've told there were over a thousand rescues and um, probably going to be many more than that because there is more rain to come. But God is good. And um, he's not a sometimey God. He's a good all the time. And all the time, through thick and thin, through high and low, God is what? Verse 18, and the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say unto him, why, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. Else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is what? Spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. Some of you are wondering, what is he going to preach about today? <laughs> I want to talk about torn coats, new patches, and old wineskin. Torn coats, new patches and old wine skin. Jesus came on the scene to show people the difference between being religious and being spiritual. The most reluctant people to accept new wine, or shall we say new attitudes, amen, are those who are drunk on the old wine or religious tradition. 
Religion is performance-based and man-centered, and it is dedicated to good reviews. Christianity is faith-based and Christ-centered and is committed to good news. Does that make sense? If I become like Christ and develop his mindset, I will do the right things because of the right reason, because I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Jesus came to provide mankind with a new kind of thinking. And the disciples of John and the traditionalists were disturbed in the way in which Jesus often did things. Jesus came to give life that was new and better, and that new and better life disturbed those who thought that the old way was fine just the way it was. Mark 2 and verse 18, the Bible said, John disciples, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, why, why do John's disciples and, uh, and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? What's up? What's the problem? And our text this morning comes at the end of three, three conflicts of controversy in the life of Jesus. Number one, if you go back and read chapter two, and I advise you uh, when you have more time to go back and to study chapter two of the book of Mark, and in verses one through 12, uh, be began some conflict that Jesus had. Uh, the first one was uh, the healing of the paralytic. Here Jesus forgave the paralytic sins and made a whole bunch of people mad and, and because they said only God can do what? Only God can forgive sins. And, and so what they were saying was, Jesus, who do you think that you are? They had a poor theology. That's the understanding of the nature of God. And they missed the point of the miracles and God's credentials. And then, and then the second conflict was they had a controversy over ritual law. That's in verses uh, 13 through 17 of chapter 2. Jesus uh, became friends with uh, tax collectors and sinners. And that made the religious people mad. So what they were saying to Jesus, do you know who they are? The first one was, who do you think you are? And then they say, do you know who they are? That was a poor anthropology, understanding of humankind. And they missed the point of evangelism. Number three, there was a controversy over fasting and the parable of putting new wine in old wineskins. In our text in chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, Jesus never pushed for his disciples to fast during his ministry. And that made all the religious zealots mad, and they were upset. And what they were saying was, do you know what the rules are? And they missed the point of holiness. Jesus came to give the world of discouraged people who were weary from burdens and loaded down with the weight of unforgiven sin a picture of who God really is. Are y'all on the line, Figueroa? A relationship with God is greater than religious tradition. I think I said something. A relationship with God is greater than preconceived notions of what we think holiness is. A relationship with God is greater than your national origin. These two parables that are sandwiched in between five controversies serve to show how Jesus decided to extend the celebration of his coming kingdom to those who least expected it or those who deserved it, even if it produced opposition by the religious establishment. Jesus used three images that are centered around a banquet celebration. We all like celebrations, don't we? We like cake and we like ice cream and we like birthday parties. We like balloons and hats and, and whistles that go, you know. Uh, uh, and so, so God's kingdom is like a wedding. In chapter 2, verse 19, uh, uh, Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast. 
Can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So in this wedding story, Jesus compared his teaching to his disciples to a wedding celebration. And at a wedding celebration, I believe you're supposed to celebrate. Am I right about it? Who goes to a wedding celebration with their mouth all turned upside down while they're looking at the bride and groom coming together uh, to, to, to start their life uh, anew and spend years of wedded bliss together? Who sits up there with their mouth turned upside down? You're supposed to celebrate at a wedding celebration. Amen? And, and so John the Baptist had described himself as the best man. Jesus as the groom. Jesus expanded John's metaphor and called his disciples children of the bride chamber, which was contemporary Jewish expression for wedding guests. Religion had become so burdensome, not because of God's actual teachings, but because of all of the rules and all of the rituals that the people had to adhere to, there was a time for fasting, but that occasion was not that occasion. Even the disciples of John the Baptist had got caught up in the traditional rules and they had missed the point. And Jesus wanted them to see that the rabbinical rituals were incompatible with the true precepts of Scripture. There's a time for fasting. There's a time for mourning. That has its place. But there's also a time for joy and celebration. Amen? I maintain that worship is a time for celebration. When we sing, we ought to open up our mouth and tell God how good he is. Amen. It's time to celebrate. God has blessed us all week. It's time uh, to call forth the praises of him that have called us out of darkness and ushered us into his marvelous light. God has been good to us. He was good to us on Monday. He, was, he turned around and was blessed us again on Tuesday. He, he showed up on weary Wednesday, and, and, and he, he comforted us on uh, uh, troubling Thursdays, and, and he was with us on frustrating Friday, and he was with us on, on fight night Saturday, and he's with us on Sunday morning. And so when I come into... God's house on Sunday morning, even though we have burdens and we have trials and tribulation, I try to turn my mouth upside right instead of upside down because it could, he could have taken me out last night. And instead of coming to worship, I could have been at the morgue. And so I'm thankful that I was able to put on my clothes and lace up my shoes and grab uh, uh, my text and come to share God's word with you on Celebration Sunday. Yeah, and Jesus says that at this time when the religious thinkers around him were criticizing him for the behavior of his disciples, his disciples were different than the disciples that they were accustomed to. They did not adhere, adhere to the traditions and the philosophies that were popular at the time. And Jesus didn't apologize for his disciples' uniqueness. How many of you have discovered that when you are different, you're often criticized? When any time you are different, you're going to get criticized and you will run into opposition. It's been happening for years and years. And we're not saying that all criticism is not deserved. Sometimes we deserve criticism. Y'all say amen to that. I'm just saying that when you are different, you can expect criticism. In this case, however, I'd rather be a fool for Jesus and be different than receive the praise of all the world and lose my soul. Aha. Uh -huh. And so rather than to descend into the criticism bowl, he challenged other people to come up to the standard of what he was teaching. So Jesus began to teach that you cannot take a garment. Ooh, this is good. That's old and prepare it with new fabric. In other words, you cannot take a new piece of leather and then try and sew it to an old piece of leather. Are you with me? If you do that through the process of time, it is going to rip 
again because the garment is not prepared to hold the old fabric because of the stretching and the weaving and the washing is going to cause it to break apart and the old fabric and the new fabric have two different textures. So Jesus was saying you can't sew the old and the new together and expect for it to last. And Jesus is saying that when you get ready for something new, you have to be careful that you don't attach it to something old, lest you ruin the integrity of the old and the new and it rip apart. Oh my God, I think I said something. Ah, and so to further the illustration, he uses an illustration that is typical at the time something that they could relate to and be able to understand easily. And that's what we, that's what we love about our God. Uh, and that's what we love about our King, that Jesus, that uh, he, Jesus makes, a profound, makes him such a profound leader is that he uses things that you can understand to teach things that are difficult to understand. Amen? He said that none of you would take new wine and put it into what? Old wineskins or old bottles. Now, people during that day were used to being around winemakers. Some of you are sitting up, have perked up. <laughs> they were used during that, to, during that time to, to, used to being around winemakers. Amen? And it was a drink that they used during meals in really just about every situation. They were well aware with the process of making wine. Their drinking system, I'm told, was different than ours. And the wine they drank was different than ours today. That's what, that's what I understand. That, but, but what they drank was not as potent as the stuff that's bottled today. Now, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. All I've had since landing was water, Gatorade, and Slurpees. So don't you leave here today talking about Maxwell is a poster boy for wine drinking. I am not. I am an advocate of staying away from those things that can become a problem. Amen? All of our families have been wrecked and ruined because of alcohol. And no person who ever became a problem drinker started out that way. One drink becomes two drinks, and, and two drinks become, why y'all looking at me like, and two drinks become three drinks, and, and before you know it, three becomes 13. Now, I like grapes. I like white grapes and red grapes. What other? Green grapes. But I'm not a connoisseur of the grape. Are y'all with me? Just grape juice, please. We who are led by Christ must watch our influence and also what influences us. Please let me know you're on the Lord's side. Amen. But, 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 but because of the tradition of the times, Jesus knew that they knew that when wine was new, it had not yet been fermented that the wine was going to go through a process of changes. Is that right? The wine, I read up on this. I don't even know. I read up on this. It had to aerate. It has to breathe, and it has to go through a process of change. Uh, it would ferment and develop pressure at certain points, and that if you put it into old wineskins, it would eventually burst. <sighs> Some of y'all laughing out there. And it would turn into something that was inflexible. It would burst because the wine is moving, the wine is processing. And Jesus said, you would not take new wine and then go and pour it into old wine skins because the old skin lacks the flexibility to make the adjustments and adapt to the growth and the process and the aging of the wine. So he's saying the problem you have that's Jesus now, with me, is that I've come to bring new wine to your old framework of thinking. Are y'all on the line? 
I've come to bring new wine to uh, your antiquated system of thinking is so concrete that if you take this and you're not, you're not willing to move, it's going to burst you to receive what I'm trying to do. Now, I've been a Christian for some time. Brother Hawkins uh, is over 30 years, uh, well over 30 years uh, that I've been in Christ. And uh, time has uh, a way of moving, doesn't it? And uh, I've seen many themes, and I like themes. We have a good one here. It's, it's what? What is our theme? Repairing and rebuilding. Is that good? Matter of fact, the theme was so good that uh, we moved it from 16 to 17. Amen? And, uh, but... When we have new themes, you have to also be willing to have new thinking. Amen? That a new theme is designed for new thinking. It, it, it does us no good to have a new theme, amen, and then bring the same concept into a new theme. Amen? So if we say we are repairing and what? Re building, we have to have the mindset of being made over and rebuilt. Amen? Uh, we cannot come to the Lord and say, I love the theme, but I'm going to stay like I am. And, and that's when I first, when I, when I, when I moved from here to Seattle, uh, we were having themes every year. In 04, it was, I want to do more in 2004. I'm coming alive. You know it. Focus uh, fruitful and fixed. Uh-huh. On my way to heaven. Uh-huh. You all are good. Ain't life great? Yeah. Time to shine. Avoiding sin. Going to heaven. Oh, this is a smart church. Uh, more than we've ever been in 2014. That don't match, does it? And people would come to the program, you know, we had the watch night services, and people would come to the program, uh, Doc, what's the, pro what's the theme going to be this year? Don't worry about the theme, what about you? People would come to the program just to know what the theme was going to be, so they could look at the banner, uh, but, but, and, and people, if Jesus isn't your focus every year, then a theme won't help you. So what happens into the process of the year, and what I came to experience is that if we were not diligent, uh, by, by the time August came around, we said, well, you know, nothing is coming alive in 2005. I still needed more in 2004. There seems like no victory in 2003. Far from heaven in 2011, by the middle of the year, what started out as a great theme, folk had not brought their new attitude to a new theme. And by the time August came around, we all needed revival. <sighs> Themes are not the problem. If we put more faith in the wrong object. Our faith cannot be in the calendar. Our faith cannot be in the clock. Amen? Your faith has to lie in God. And what God is able to do in your life, if we put too much faith in people and they don't act right, when things don't go right, it's hard for us to handle it because we put faith in the wrong object. Amen? Now, now God is saying, I, I've been telling you, stop trusting in people. And circumstances which you rarely fix and trust in me who can change the people and circumstances. Clean your heart out so that you can serve me all of it and not some of it. I want to tell you that every day is an opportunity. I said every day. Every day is an opportunity to know God and experience God in a more powerful way. And the reality is, is that many times we waste too many opportunities given because we don't understand the idea of seizing opportunity. Amen? After service, uh, someone would say, um, 
Well, I really enjoyed the sermon, and I started to ask for prayer. And the service is over. I almost shouted today, Doc. I almost. I need prayer for my family, and I started to come before the church. I almost came before the church. Someone says, you know, I almost shed a tear. Well, why didn't you cry? I almost went and made things right with the person I've been struggling with. That sermon moved me, then it almost moved me to go and apologize. Almost. I almost called somebody, encouraged them, but now they're gone. They died, but I almost called them to encourage them while they were sick. I almost obeyed the Lord in baptism. I almost asked for prayer. We ought to take advantage of the opportunities while we have them, for the Bible says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And in Ephesians 5 and 16, I thought I'd drop this. It said, do not be what? Drunk with wine which is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul here is talking to some people who took advantage of the wrong opportunity. They were missing all kind of opportunities because they were focused on the wrong thing to fill them up. And some folk are trying to get full of new wine, but they need to be full of the Spirit. Oh my goodness, I think I'm preaching this morning. Uh, every moment that God gives us is a gift and is a responsibility to maximize the moment that's in front of us. There's a benefit that you gain when you walk with God. One benefit of age is that it helps us to appreciate living. Amen. People don't want to talk about how old they are. But I'd rather be old. But the clients say, don't look at me. <laughs> I'd rather be old than gone. Amen? Yeah, yeah. Age teaches us to appreciate some things. It helps us to appreciate when we were young. And you used to do the things that we thought everybody was able to do, but it's when you get older and realize that you can't do it that you thank God that you could do it. And you thank God for the season that you're in right now. Amen? Yeah, yeah, there's a benefit. There's a benefit. The closer that you get to the end of a thing, you ought to appreciate every day of it. One of the, uh, I don't know if I said this word, the frivolities of youth is that uh, they often think they're going to live forever. I used to think I'm going to live forever. And my daddy got gray hair, and I said, well, I'm never going to get gray hair. I don't know where he got that gray hair from. And now I got it. Amen. The concept of leaving here and not being here really crosses our mind. You, you need a few aches and pains in your body, yeah, to appreciate, appreciate things. Amen. Yeah, you, you, you need to have... Uh, some aches and pains. You need to have your back get bad every now and then to realize that you're getting an email from heaven that you're not going to be here forever. When you go to the eye doctor and your prescription has changed, that's an email from heaven saying you're not going to be here forever. It's time to get some things right. A amen? Uh, the Bible said it is appointed. In other words, everybody has an appointment. It is appointed unto man what? It didn't say five times to die. It said once to die, and then after this comes what? Comes, comes the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. Now, now to die and come back and die again and come back as something or somebody else. You know, people tell me, in my former life, I was a tiger. That's foolishness. You have one appointment, you have a one-time appointment here and a one-time appointment to leave here, and you're not coming back once you're gone. If you are a disciple of Jesus, there comes a commitment and a focus that there are some things that I cannot afford to keep on bothering me because I'm too close to the last days to allow anything to move me from my anchored spot in Jesus. There's some criticism that you can't respond to because you don't have time to spend the rest of your life trying to explain what God has done for you. Is anybody in the house this morning? 
You've got to preserve whatever time you have left because you don't know what time God is going to call you home. So you need to be getting ready. And then when you get ready, you need to stay ready. Get ready, get ready, and then stay ready. Amen? I think there are a few people in here this morning that have come to understand the preciousness of time that has been given to you because life is precious. You must decide what you will lend your energy to. Frankly speaking, you don't have time for a lot of foolishness. One of the reasons that I uh, tell you you don't have time is to know of the time that we have wasted in the past. Oh, my goodness. And you look back and say, I don't know if anybody's in this frame of mind, if I could do it all over again, if I'd only known then what I know now. I would have dealt with that differently. Anybody ever thought that before? Why in the world, knowing what I know now, did I ever let that bother me the way it did then? But you can't know what you don't know. It's through the process of time. God is teaching us. Am I right about it? He's teaching us. Why did I respond to that situation in the first place? You responded to it because you didn't know any better. Why did I spend all of that time trying to reconcile with the person who didn't want to reconcile with me? I should have just went ahead and forgave them and went on about my business. I was calling them, chasing them down, running them down, trying to beg them to forgive me. They didn't want to have anything. I should have just forgiven them and let God deal with it. I realize now that there are many opportunities that are knocking at our door and, and we miss them. So, Lord, I promise you that with every day that I have left, I'm going to do what you have asked me to do in your word. That is redeem the time because we're living in evil days. I like days like these when we're in the, just past the middle of the year. And it's what, it's August uh, 27. And in the middle of the year, when the year is not over yet, and you still have time to kind of go back and repair and some fix some things, while you still have time left, we hope, for the rest of the year, like, we don't always have to wait till December 31st to go back and, and try to redeem the time. And there's no more year left in 2017 that we can take some time on August 27th to kind of reassess and reevaluate where we are in life and say, you know, I messed that up in the early part of the year, but God, if you give me strength to make it to the rest of the year, I, I promise you, I'm going to make it right this time. The, 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 the middle part of the year allows us to be able to, to go in and, and, and prepare ourselves and, and ask for a new mind. The four months uh, that we have left in this year, we can go back and help to repair and renew the four months that just went by. And that prayerfully, we, as we move through 2017, and, and that we redeem the rest of this year better than we have before. I believe that there's somebody in here that is determined that the same eight months that have gone by, they're not going to be like the rest of them. And we're going to do some things differently for the time that we have left. God gave us all the same year. Amen? It's amazing how you can... Give the same children the same opportunities. One child will take it, and another one will waste it. Come from the same mama, have the same genetic makeup, been given the same benefits, gone to the same school, but not react the same way because they don't have the same thought process. God wants to bless you immensely in 2017 and he wants you to maximize that blessing by having a new mind in Christ Philippians 2 and 5 I believe you know this scripture the Bible said let this mind be where let this mind be in your neighbor let this mind be in your friend that you 
want to get right. No, let this mind be in you, which was what? Also in Christ Jesus. Jesus did not come to put a patch on the garment of your mind. Jesus came to bring a new outfit that you could wear for eternity. He doesn't want you to patch up an old lifestyle. A lot of us are just patching up things. We're just plugging holes. We're just putting a patch on it, hoping that we'll do better than we've done before. No, he wants, he wants to give you a brand new lifestyle. Besides, you cannot patch sinfulness. Amen? It must be dealt with at the core. You cannot just wear some Jesus on an old self. You have to put him on. For, for you are all the sons of God through faith where? In Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Like putting on a new set of clothing. And if any man, Galatians 3, 26, 27 says, If any man be where? In Christ he is a new creature. What, brother preacher? Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are like new. Jesus stood between us and the devil, stepped in as death rushed toward us. The serpent struck the blow into the Savior's side. He died, but his death makes a way for us to be lifted out of the pit of sin. But thank God Almighty, he didn't stay dead once he died. He proved to the world that he is the only Savior, the only Lord, the only begotten Son of God. Wherefore, God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above what? Above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. The president's knee is going to bow. The cabinet's knee is going to bow. Of things in heaven and in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, that's going to be a great day, isn't it? Every tongue. Those that don't want to confess him now are going to, be, are going to have to confess him in the judgment. In a, in a few days, August is going to move into September. Another month passed on the journey of this year. And we need to make up in our minds right now, today, that we will not take the same old mentality further on our journey to make heaven our home. There's some things we need to let go. Amen? This, this is the moment when we drop off unconfessed sin. This is the day when we drop off old burdens and heavy weights of care and concern and lay it at the feet of Jesus where we know that the, the load, he will exchange his load for our load. For Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is Jesus your savior today? The question that I'm asking is that is he Lord of your life? If he is not Lord of your life, he ought to be. This is a good day to put the Savior on in baptism. He's the Savior who saves. He's the King who rules. He's the Shepherd who oversees. So we should accept the Savior who did something for you that you could not do for yourself. And so you want to accept his gospel for the gospel is the good news in a world that's shown up gone bad. I think I told you every day seemed like it's breaking news. Every time I go home and I turn on CNN, it's breaking news. And I run over and flick over on MSNBC, it's breaking news. Some channels I don't turn to anymore. But it's breaking news everywhere. And we live in a world where we're constantly getting what seems like bad news. But Jesus has good news in a world that's gone bad. And sometimes we focus more on the bad news than we do on the good news. And all is not bad. There is some good news. And Jesus is that good news in a world gone bad. Would you open your heart to believe him? John 8 and verse number 24, if you believe not that I am he, the Bible says that you will die 
in your sins if you believe not that I am he. And the Lord put a lot of emphasis on faith, faith in him that he said that your trust in him will allow you to make a faith response to the good news and repent of your sins in Acts 2 and verse 38. That's turning away from your transgressions. Amen? And, and walking away from them and being sorrowful of them and confessing Christ. And you give us your hand and give God your heart and go down to the liquid tomb of baptism to have your sins washed away. Everybody ought to remember the day Jesus washed their sins away. And we may forget a lot of things in life, but you ought to remember when you were baptized and your sins were washed away. And I found that the Lord will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. His promises are so divine that they never fail. And he's offering you heavenly sunlight, that which will flood your soul with glory divine. And you can say hallelujah and be able to rejoice singing his praises with all of your sins forgiven. All of your errors deleted. God hits the backspace button on the keyboard of your life and allows you to start over. In that case, I hope he keep his finger on the backspace button of my life and just keep on deleting those errors because I am his child and I wear his name. Did you not know that you have royal blood flowing through your veins? That you're a king's kid, Brother Damon, a member of his kingdom, washed in his blood, walking in the newness of life. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. If you're here this morning and you've been trying to put a patch, a new patch on the old garment of your life, we want you to understand that it won't work. And a lot of times we're just patching things. We get a new book and we hope that'll help us. Amen. We go and get a new jogging outfit and start an exercise regimen hoping that we'll become a new person. No, you'll lose some weight, but it'll still be the same you. Amen? Amen. We'll go on a, on a distant, go to a distant land hoping that if I get away for a little while, things are going to change. And you come back and it's right where you left it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, maybe if I lay down and I go to sleep for an hour or two and I wake up and that problem will be gone and you wake up and it's staring you where? Right back at your eyeballs. And sometimes the problem is not everything around you. It's what's going on inside of you. You've been patching new garments on an old framework of mine. And Jesus said, your life will burst unless you change. Amen? What does change happen? It first starts with recognizing that I need change. It's not all right. It's not all good. Where does the change happen? It starts with me. Did I, did I, did I ever say that if I got an issue going on with me and you come into my space, you're going to be affected by my issues. If I'm boxing myself and I'm hitting myself all upside the head, if Joe comes into my space, he's going to get hit. Is that right? Because what affects me if he comes into my space will affect him. And I can blame Joe for coming into my space and causing a problem, but I have to say, you know, it was me in the first place. The fight was not with Brother Joe. The fight was with my spirit. Yeah. I've been patching new garment on an old mind. And that's why the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He that was high came down what? Low. To bring we who were low he who was rich became poor so that we who are poor, you heard this, amen? Yeah. Nobody is too low that they can't be found. That's right. 
stand on your feet. Nobody, nobody that's far out is so far out that they can't be what? Brought back in. That's right. Nobody is too dirty that they can't be cleaned up. That's right. I know what he did for me and what he's done for others, he can also do for you. What's our song? Hide you in the blood. Hide you in the blood. Sing it. Sing. Hide Come you in the blood. You the hear? And you want prayer? I hide you in the blood. Of you want a new mind? Jesus. A new Come garment. For the Lord will take Come on. Come on. Hide you in the blood. Oh, hide you in the blood. Well, for the storm. Storms are raging. Storms are raging high. Hide you in the blood. Hide me in your blood. Till that danger. I want to stop patching my life. Come to the shelter. There's a safe retreat. Hide you. Jesus. for the storm. The storm. We'll hide you in the blood of Jesus. Oh, hide you in the blood. Storms are raging high. Storms are raging high. Hide you in the blood. Hide you in the blood till the dangers pass you by.